Have you ever heard of a concept called the butterfly effect? It was a movie. I, I never saw the movie. But the concept, the butterfly effect, it's very real. And it's something that we deal with all the time when dealing with cars, modifying cars. The butterfly effect goes something like this. You know, a butterfly someplace in South America, let's say, flaps its wings just a certain way. And because it flapped its wings that way, cause and effect, 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 somebody nukes Ohio. Right? Seemingly completely unrelated things, but because it sets off a chain reaction, unintended consequences, things you would never expect to happen, they happen. And when you're dealing with modifying cars, it's, it's the rule rather than the exception. And sometimes it's really not apparent. But let me tell you what brings me to this. I get this, asked this question a lot, and it came up the other night, we did a live, and somebody said, I'm going to pick up a class, I want to pick up a classic car and use it as a daily driver. What modifications do you recommend? So my immediate reaction to this is zero modifications. If you're going to pick up a classic car and use it as a daily driver, zero modifications. My rule of thumb when it comes to a daily driver, now this is important, we have to make these important distinctions. We have to make these important distinctions. We're talking about a driver, we're talking about a car that you're going to get into. We're talking about a car you could toss your keys to your wife or your mom and they could get in it and they could drive it in traffic, they could drive it on the interstate, they could drive it anywhere, they could drive it in the rain, they could drive it in the snow, they could drive it at, at 10 degrees below zero, they could drive it at 100 degrees through the desert. Doesn't make any difference. It's a driver. So it's got to do everything just normal. Okay? Important, very important distinction. Hot rod is different. You know, a, a street race car is different. A street machine is different. A drag car is different. A road race car is different. An autocrosser is different. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about a car that you're intended to use as a daily driver. My rule of thumb is if I'm going to use it as a daily driver, Suspension, brakes, and steering are off limits, right? Those things, I am not going to attempt to outsmart the team of engineers to put this car together. Right? These guys were brilliant, and they worked as teams, and they took every possible consideration, every possible contingency into consideration when they designed these packages. And the package is designed specifically for the car. So when they go about... Well, we're going to talk about braking systems. And, and I'll tell you what, before you even get heavy into that, this relates. I'll show you something that I did today. And it'll give you a, a general idea where I'm coming from. So we picked up this 99XJ last week, and I decided I'm going to set it up for towing. So the factory rates it at 5,000 pound towing capacity. And part of that rating, the 5,000 pounds, has to do with the braking capability of the Jeep. It's stock brakes. So it should be able to safely slow down and stop a 5,000 pound load from interstate speeds in a, 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 an efficient period of time with minimum of drama, All right? So because it's right on the edge, I know it's right on the edge because we're going to be towing 5,000, maybe a couple hundred pounds more than that. I know it's going to be right on the edge. I'm not going to modify the braking system. I don't want to modify the braking system, and I'll get into the reasons why in, in a minute. But I have to look around and look at all of the possible liabilities. So one of the things, this Jeep came with these wheels. I just pulled them off today. I'm, I'm, first, because I mean, I'm really not crazy about the look, but that's not why I took them off. I took them off because these are much larger diameter. These are 17-inch rims and much larger diameter tires than the truck was originally designed and the braking system was originally designed to use. So it's kind of counterintuitive. You look at this and you say, well, of course, the bigger tires and wheels are going to be able to stop it better. But no, it's actually backwards. I want you to think of it this way. The mass of the vehicle is, is represented by the axle center line. So you're going to slow down the mass of the vehicle, and the mass of the vehicle is attached right here. Now, if you look at the distance between the center of the axle center line, or where the mass is acting on the wheel, and its contact patch, this is a greater distance than the stock 
tire and wheel combination. Which means that this mass is going to have more leverage against the rotor than a shorter tire, which would give the mass less leverage against the rotor. So therefore, the smaller diameter wheel will closer match the diameter of the rotor and give this thing the stopping power it was intended to have. Now, you would never notice a difference like that in regular daily driving traffic. And you probably wouldn't notice that difference either under, even under an extreme, like a panic stop situation. But now, load 5,000 pounds onto the back of this thing and try to slow it down rapidly from 70 miles an hour. And that's where the unintended consequences happen. So we pulled these off and we put on a set of stock size tires and wheels. And now we know that the stock braking system, as long as everything is functioning the way it's supposed to, the stock braking system is going to definitely be capable of slowing down from 70 miles an hour from highway speed of a 5,000 pound load. Of course, we're putting trailer brakes on it too. You know, we want every, every little bit that we can get, but you get the general idea. The bigger diameter tire would render the stock size brakes less efficient under extreme circumstances. So, laws of unintended consequences. And like I said, this is why I, I, when it comes to tires, steering, brakes, and suspension, I do not try to outsmart the engineers. These guys paid, guys, they were brilliant people who got paid a lot of money and they took every little thing into consideration. So my pet peeve, we were talking about brakes, okay? One of my pet peeves is the people who automatically say, if a car's got drum brakes, it was born with drum brakes, or it's got stock disc brakes on it, let's say smallish disc brakes, right away, oh, you gotta put, you gotta convert it. You gotta put, you gotta put six piston calipers on the front. You gotta do all of these things. Right? You need to convert it to disc brake, even if it's just a stock this conversion but you're not taking everything into consideration see what you have to realize is that when the engineers sit down and they create the braking package for a specific car they take every possible contingency into consideration they take every aspect of the car into consideration what is its intended speed range what is its maximum speed what is the weight of this car what is the weight of this car with just a driver? What is the weight of this car with five passengers and a trunk full of luggage? What is the weight bias on this car unladen? What's the weight bias with it fully loaded down? All of these things are taken into consideration. How much suspension travel is there? What is the braking? What is the weight distribution front to back when the car is static, when the car is at 10 miles an hour? So let's say at 10, 20 miles an hour, you could have... Uh, under, under braking, deceleration, normal deceleration, you have 60% of the weight on the front wheels and 40% of the weight on the back wheels. I'm just pulling a number, right? But now at 40 miles an hour, when you decelerate like that, you've got 80% of the weight on the front wheels and 20% on the back wheels. At the car's maximum velocity, you've got 95% of the weight on the front wheels, you know, maximum braking at maximum velocity, and 5% on the back wheels. And I'm, I'm just, I'm using numbers these aren't specific numbers, but just to give you the example. And that's going to be different from every car, from car to car. From... So the, all of these things are taken into consideration when they design a braking package. So now you're just going to go ahead and make a simple disc brake swap. And generally, it's like it's like a, it's an afternoon's thing, especially if you're using like factory parts, right? You just you unbolt the spindles, you bolt the new spindles on, you change the brake hoses, whatever you got to do, and that's it. You motor down the road. 99% of the time, when people do a disc brake swap, that's what they're doing. But they're not taking everything else into consideration because this is an integrated package of the car. Example, I'll give you an example, uh, and I'll use a Plymouth Roadrunner for example. You take a '69 Plymouth Roadrunner. The factory, the, the stock brake package is 11-inch drums on the front, 11 by 3 is on the front, 11 by 2 is on the back. Now, if you ordered disc brakes on that car, you didn't get the 11-inch drums on the back. You got 10-inch drums on the back because the front brakes aren't as efficient. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but the front brakes take aren't as efficient as the rears. 
right? The front discs are not going to be as efficient as the rears. And so what they did was they put 10-inch diameter drums. So if you ordered a disc brake Roadrunner, you got the discs on the front and you got the smaller 10-inch diameter drums on the rear to equalize the braking. Most disc brake cars of the era had power brakes because it takes that much more pedal effort to stop the disc brake car than it does the drum brake car. We're not talking about brake fade. We're not talking about repeated high speed stops, right? We're not talking about auto crossing or anything like that. We're not talking about hot lapping at the drag strip. We're talking about just driving this thing on the road and doing normal stops and the occasional panic stop from a higher speed. This is what is designed into the car. And if you're dealing with a driver, a driver type car, you know, this is important. Now, not all classic cars are created equal. And when I consider a car for classic, a classic car for daily use, I use a device, there's a cutoff line, all right? And I consider it to be interstate era. So you've got pre-interstate era cars and post-interstate era cars. Pre-interstate era cars are generally designed for 55 mile an hour, two lane roads, occasional higher speeds, but typically they would be operated in the 55, 60 mile an hour range it was an easier life before the interstates. Once the interstates came along, the dynamics of traffic changed. And so cars built post-interstate era. So let's say 1962, 63, 64. Cars built in the later 60s into the 70s are fully capable of existing in today's world. They will function just fine in today's world, providing that all of the pieces are up to snuff. You don't have to modify them. Now, let's just say you do make a modification. Let's go back to this thing about the butterfly effect and, and let's say, making a front disc brake swap on a car that originally had drums. So here are things that you need to take into consideration, okay? Because the factory did. Now, some cars, the pedal ratio. So the pedal ratio on the brake pedal is often different from one type of braking to another. The length is going to be the same, but the pivot point, right? So here's the pivot point, and here's where the, where the pin, the activator pin for the master cylinder, that's where this would bolt on. This distance from here to here is the pedal ratio. Is it different on your make and model of car when you go from disc to drum? That's one consideration. The master cylinder. Now, this is a drum brake master cylinder. It has two equal-sized reservoirs. It has a, a, a certain diameter. Now, this is all tuned to the braking package of the car. It has a certain diameter and length of the bore. The chambers are different sizes. This is designed to work with the drum brakes. If you just make a disc-to-drum conversion, this master cylinder will apply the brakes, but it's not going to apply them correctly. So then you've got, now some cars have different diameter brake lines that come from the master cylinder and go down to the metering block slash proportioning valve. So that's this right here. So on a drum brake car, it's not a proportioning valve, it's a metering block. The metering is really done all through diameters, the diameter and we were talking about the diameter of master cylinder, the diameter of the wheel cylinders. They're different, and they tune the braking capability of the car based on the size of those bores, right? When you go to a disc drum car, they don't use a metering block. They use a proportioning valve, but not just any proportioning valve. It has to be a proportioning valve that matches the braking capability of the car. The wrong size proportioning valve either won't send enough pressure to the back brakes or will send too much pressure to the back brakes, depending on the weight and the weight transfer characteristics of the car on deceleration. See what I'm saying? All of these things need to be taken into consideration. You've changed the front discs, but now you've still got the rear drums. The diameter of the wheel cylinder, the diameter of the drum, the width of the drum, all have to be taken into consideration to maintain the proper braking bias under hard deceleration. Now, these are things you may never, ever notice in daily driving. And yeah, by making that change from drum to disc, you may shave 10 feet off your 60 to zero, right? Which is great. 
But what's the overall effect during a higher speed paddock stop? What's the overall effect on a road that's a little wet, a little snotty, maybe icy, right? What is the overall effect under extreme circumstances? Not just a controlled stop on flat, dry pavement. You get where I'm, you get where I'm going with this? You can't just make one little change. Nothing happens in a vacuum. So it's that butterfly effect, and you really don't know what all of the different causes and effects are going to lead to. Now, we're not talking about race cars. We're not talking about modified cars because that's a completely different, completely different thing. I mean, you, if you take, let's say, a dragster, right, which is the ultimate expression of the hot rod, the dragster has no front brakes at all. Why? Because all of the weight is at the back of the car. There's no downforce. There's no weight. There's nothing on the front wheels to give them any traction to stop. So there's no point in having any front brakes on there. All they're going to do is lock up. Now you go the exact opposite end of the spectrum and you talk about a basically stock muscle car. And there, 80% of the braking, 70 to 80% of the braking is done by the front wheels because that's where all of the weight is. I tell you what, you look at the difference between a dragster and a funny car, right? So they both go approximately at the same speed. They have the same characteristics as far as performance goes. But while the dragster has zero front brakes, the funny car has front brakes because it has a shorter wheelbase, so it puts some weight on the front wheels, gives them some traction there, and then you got thousands of pounds of downforce pushing down on the body. So the front wheels actually do have the ability to break this thing. But either way, the funny cars and dragsters still stop at approximately the same distance. I know parachutes, but forgetting about parachutes. The point is, one, one setup does not fit all. You have to tailor it to the use. And if your use is as a daily driver, your best bet, if you want to just be happy with this thing and, and have hassle-free performance, your best bet is to just take the components and the systems that are already in the car and just optimize them. Make sure that the, the, the shoes fit the drums correctly. Make sure that, you know what I mean? Make sure that all of the bits and pieces, all the wheel cylinders are functioning correctly. Make sure that all the lines are clear. Nothing is collapsed or anything like that. Make sure everything's properly adjusted. Make sure the self-adjusters work. And you will not beat, for an overall package, you will not beat what the engineers designed into that car. Things get different if you're talking about now you're going to put like skinny skinnies on the front and you're going to put slicks on the back. Well, now you're changing the dynamic of the car and that becomes a different situation. But when you're talking about a stock, basically a stock driver or a stock muscle car, leave this stuff alone. Like I said, for me, steering, brakes, suspension, off limits. Whatever the factory designed into this thing is what I'm going to deal with because I don't have to think about it. I know I'm not creating any unforeseen circumstances there's no butterfly effect in the package that this car was born with they worked all of that stuff through i'm not trying to tell you how to build a car i'm not trying to tell you what should make you happy or anything like that i'm not trying to be a contrarian all i'm doing is trying to share a lifetime of experience because i've dealt with all of this stuff cars that stop with parachutes and cars that barely have enough brakes to get themselves slowed down from 60 miles an hour been there done it got the t-shirt through all of that and i've been driving classic cars for right, since classic cars were new cars so i've been through all of these situations and i'm not being contrarian just for the sake of being contrarian and i'm not trying to be a know-it-all or anything like that just trying to share experience to help you think through modifications or potential modifications before you just dive in and go because thinking through things and taking everything into consideration is the best way obviously but you know nobody makes any money telling you to think people make money by telling you here buy this part buy this service nobody makes any money by saying hey take a minute and actually think this whole thing through and that's all i'm trying to do here all right i hope you guys got something out of that i'll see you tomorrow